So without further ado, I will let you take it away, Dr. Halpern. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, so hi, all. Um, so I am at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I am an ICU doc and an ethicist and health services researcher. I do a lot of work on uh, using behavioral economic insights to improve the behaviors of seriously ill patients, their caregivers, and most importantly, their clinicians. Um, but a lot of our work is increasingly uh, looking from a population health lens uh, at how we can make uh, healthcare delivery more equitable and cost effective and things of that nature. Um, I think I was invited to speak to you today based on an article that some colleagues and I published uh, in JAMA maybe a month or so ago now, uh, in which we uh, really elucidated some of the reasons why policy responses, particularly in the United States, albeit not exclusively here in the US, uh, were flawed uh, and could have been better, and could have been better particularly had policy leaders had a better appreciation of many of the psychologic uh, biases that pervade all human decision making. And, and that's what I thought I'd uh, talk to you about today. So plan to speak for maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, and then uh, really open it up to questions and, and comments. And hopefully this will turn into more of a conversation than, than anything else. So uh, I, I want to start out by saying that we didn't get the title of our article uh, as we liked it. The editors sort of kiboshed that. Um, what we had proposed calling the piece was Visible Lives and Hidden Deaths. And the idea behind that is that there are a number of ways in which normal human decision making uh, really does prioritize the readily imaginable or identifiable lives and deprioritizes what we might call statistical lives, the lives you read about in reports of the tolls of the pandemic. Um, we get very riled up by thoughts that we might, we or our loved ones might wind up in an emergency room and need uh, aggressive medical care, and it may not be available because others are using it. We can imagine that fairly vividly, and yet it's harder to imagine large numbers of people in distant parts of our state, if not our country, uh, receiving suboptimal care or being placed at unnecessary health risks because of things that we didn't do, like contact tracing or ramping up testing or wearing our masks or things of that nature. And so that, that tendency to prioritize the readily imaginable over the invisible uh, dovetails nicely, or I shouldn't say nicely, but in a uh, somewhat dangerous mix uh, with some other biases whereby we also pr uh, prioritize the present over the future and things that are, we cause directly versus things that we might allow to happen indirectly. And I'll go through these in, in, a, in a bit more detail, but wanted to just sort of lay that out as a, as a general framework that if in the future uh, we were better able to right size our perspectives such that we don't so grossly overweight identifiable lives and rather consider all lives equally, whether or not they're close to us. And if we are able to delay our gratification such that we're more willing to make some sacrifices in the short term for greater freedoms and liberties and luxuries in the future. And if we're willing to come to grips with the ethical reality that if we 
allow, uh, sorry, if we quote unquote cause, make an active decision not to save a patient, that is not any worse than making an inactive decision not to prevent a patient from getting sick. And those types of uh, approaches can really improve public health uh, over the long haul. So we enumerated a number of, of specific biases. I've, I've already mentioned the uh, distinction between you know, visible lives and hidden deaths. Economists for a long time have called this the identifiable victim effect. So this explains why you know, if one person is trapped at the top of Mount Rushmore, uh, not Mount Rushmore, I'm sorry, um, any, any high mountaineering uh, mountain, I have a, 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 an image of Trump's face on Mount Rushmore now emblazoned in my head and it's clouded all my own thinking. Uh, but, but say Mount St. Helens or any other uh, large mountain. And, and the mountaineer's trapped and a, a very reasonable projection would say that it's going to take, you know, 10 uh, people to go try and save this person and still in the middle of it, in midst of an avalanche. And say there's some 20% probability that that rescue squad of 10 people will actually die in, in the process of trying to save the one. Typically, that squad will still go out, uh, right? Because it's, it's an identifiable victim that if we don't uh, devote all our commitments to trying to save that identifiable life, then it, it just feels awful. And, and that's a very human response. Uh, but why do we not mount similar uh, aversion to the possibility that we might cause many more deaths by not heeding best practices when it comes to reducing spreads of a pandemic, be it masks, contact tracing, et cetera. And this was an incredibly visible thing in many countries, but nowhere more so than in the US when one of the first things that happened when uh, people actually started believing that COVID was really a threat here is we started investing heavily in building more ICU beds and building more ventilators and all of these stockpiling strategies of critical care resources that would only help this very sickest of the sick and not, frankly, do that much to help those people anyway, even if any of those resources were needed. And thankfully, almost none of them were, uh, even under what we've gone through thus far. But the idea that we would commit full on to building resources to save immediately threatened lives, even before we uh, mobilized efforts to contain viral transmission, was, was incredibly myopic and wasteful. The federal government in the US spent $3 trillion up front to build extra ventilators, none of which actually were needed. And even if they had been quote unquote needed, would have made a very, very small impact on the total mortality rate. Because those who would have the best chance of benefiting from those ventilators would have gotten them anyway. And it's only those who probably would die with or without one that those you know, extra stockpile of ventilators ever could have plausibly helped. By contrast, we could have saved you know, exponentially more lives by immediately just shutting down uh, the entire country, truthfully, uh, would have done, um, you know, immeasurably more good than any investment in, you know, clinical resources ever might have. And, and truthfully, we would be out of the pandemic by this point in the U.S. for all intents and purposes, had we just made the difficult short-term decision to just completely criminalize, uh, you know, leaving your home for a period of time, except under, you know, certain uh, exceptions. So that was, that was the first example, is the identifiable uh, victim effect. The second is uh, what we call optimism bias, which is the very deeply ingrained and evolutionarily selected, for, for very good reason, uh, tendency to 
imagine that if presented with a best case, worst case, and most likely case scenario, we're all a little bit hardwired to imagine that at least when it comes to ourselves, the best case scenario is in fact the most likely. And we, we do this systematically and, and it serves many purposes. Uh, you know, as an ICU doc, I care for a lot of patients for whom hope and optimism is, is a powerful force. And we never try and um, uh, curtail a patient or a family member's optimism, but we do try and level set expectations such that while maintaining hope for the best, uh, patients and their families are also prepared for the worst. And that's the kind of level setting expectations that I think leaders had an opportunity to do, but, but, but really missed out on. Uh, and if we had not been so susceptible to this optimism bias, we would have much more strongly prepared for the worst case scenario, which would have led to an early shutdown, that rather than the best case scenario, which made the risk benefit trade off of an early shutdown much less appealing. The third thing is uh, something I've also alluded to before, which uh, psychologists call present bias. So this is the tendency to uh, prefer $100 today to even $105 uh, a year from now, right? So if I gave all of you that option, you know, would you rather have $100 today or $105 a year from now? You probably all uh, prefer $100 today. And, and even if that was not, uh, you know, with current inflation rates, that's probably not like the truly wise, or, and interest rates for that matter, that's probably not the fiscally wise choice. And yet we would all do it because, uh, you know, we value benefits in the present more so than benefits in the future, which we tend to discount. It's the same reasoning that explains why uh, we want the piece of chocolate cake today and we go to the gym tomorrow or we'll commit to going to the gym tomorrow or why smokers have a hard time uh, giving up smoking because uh, the pains of giving up smoking accrue in the present and the benefits of giving up smoking accrue at some distant point in the future. So this same tendency, uh, you know, kind of averts uh, people from buying into concepts of making early term sacrifices, such as staying at home, distancing from loved ones, wearing masks, which are inconvenient and somewhat uncomfortable, particularly as the weather gets warmer, uh, and all those sorts of things, because the benefits of doing that, uh, A, seem to accrue to other people, uh, and we don't realize that those same benefits in turn accrue to ourselves through a sense of community. Uh, and, and B, that those benefits when they do accrue, accrue down the line. So any policy that's got uh, a, a seeming potential, even, be, even if a low likelihood of saving a life in the present, is going to be naturally prioritized over a corresponding policy that, that um, even if it's more likely to save many more lives if those lives are, are in the future. And then um, the, the final uh, bias that we described in the paper and I think is really operative here is, is what we might call omission bias, which is the tendency to prefer that if, if some harm has to be committed or if some negative consequence has to happen, we prefer that it happen by virtue of us failing to do something rather than as a direct consequence of our, our doing something. And this is, I think, what accounted for all sorts of, of heated debate about uh, policies that were put into place that would say, you know, if resources are scarce, we need to allocate them preferentially to those who are most likely to benefit them because those policies put docs in the position of not uh, mounting all conceivable efforts to save a life in front of them, even if doing so is for the greater good and will save more lives overall. Uh, it's the same idea that accounts for um, the well-described trolley problem. I don't know if people are familiar with the trolley problem, but, but for those who, who aren't, this is sort of a classic, you know, ethics 101 dilemma where uh, people are asked, like, if you are standing at 
uh, an intersection when a trolley is coming straight on and there's a Y and with the way the lever uh, that directs that trolley is currently positioned, that trolley will go right into five people who are trapped on the rails and kill them. And if you flip the lever, instead that trolley will go to the other part of the Y and kill one person who's trapped on that rail. And an amazing number of people would not flip that switch because they feel like to flip it is actively killing that one person, whereas by doing nothing, it's not their responsibility that the five people died. And it's, it's a similar kind of, of bias that I think holds sway here. So my hope is that in the future, if we can um, uh, prioritize statistical lives as much as we prioritize invisible ones or readily identifiable ones, if we can better prioritize the future and in fact establish legislation that requires us to account for the future in our policy setting, and um, if we can uh, better accommodate the reality that errors of uh, commission are no worse necessarily than errors of omission, then I think we can uh, right size our uh, public health and policy responses to either future waves of, of this pandemic or uh, future pandemics or other uh, disasters. So I'll stop there. Um, and uh, like I said, I hope we, we can open it up to a conversation. Absolutely. Uh, so as I said, please feel free to turn on your video and your um, microphone and ask your questions yourself. Um, if you for any reason can't do that, I can also read them out of the chat box for you. Uh, but if you want to just do that or and or physically raise your hand when you do so, it doesn't seem like a lot of people are turning their monitors on. Um, Oh, great, we've got a question right off the bat. Please go ahead. Hi, Scott, I'm Janice Stein, and thank you for that presentation. Um, the research evidence around all of these biases are that they are remarkably resistant to change. And that even though people, once people are made aware of them and we do experiments over and over again, it has relatively little impact on their capacity to mitigate them. Self-awareness is a marginal solution. So I wonder where your optimism is that you concluded your lecture with. Where is, where is the evidence for that optimism is what I'm asking. Thank you. Yeah, it, that is a great point, Janice. Uh, it, it, one of the really painful lessons of 50 years of scholarship and you know, decision psychology, behavioral economics, whatever you want to call it, uh, is exactly as you note, um, the uh, strength and pervasiveness of, of these biases and their resistance to change, to use your words. That said, I do think it's different when we're talking about trying to change individual behavior than when it's uh, talking about trying to change governance. Policymaking, even in a pandemic, occurs, you know, over a, a, a period of time that is sufficient for responsible governments to establish policies that rein in their own biases uh, and enact policies that rein in the biases of others. And so this is not to say that we need to, um, I will say, you know, that the piece wound up getting published in a way that a lot of it was about, you know, messaging to the public to counter their biases. That I will say that's not exactly how we originally intended the piece. Um, we, uh, we really thought that the, the better approach would be that if we, we, we regularly do turn to governance to, uh, promote public well-being and policies could have been act enacted, for example, that required the U.S. federal government to do a cost-benefit analysis prior to any 
investment of greater than, I don't know, $100 million, right? And, and that cost-benefit analysis, no matter who was leading it, uh, would have unambiguously suggested that spending $3 trillion, I'm sorry, $3 billion, <laughs> even the US is not that stupid, uh, $3 billion on ventilators would have a much, much lower cost-benefit analysis than spending you know, $1 billion on contract tracing. Um, and so a simple policy enactment could have, uh, on, the, on the government side, could, to rein in its own biases, could have had dramatic public health effects. But I agree with you, with you entirely that you know, trying to just do a better job messaging this so that people surmount their own present biases is, is probably not gonna do a hell of a lot of good. But every little bit counts. Yeah, yeah, all right, it definitely can't hurt. And, and there were some real missed opportunities there too around just like a lot of the language that's been used is all this, this military language of standing up and standing down services and units. And, uh, you know, Mario Cuomo was quoted as saying that ventilators are to this war, what bombs were to world. Like all this stuff is just completely, I think, misguided uh, rhetoric uh, when this isn't this isn't a war, uh, this is a public health crisis and we all need to be in it together. And, it, and even if it, we think of it as a war, the solution, the way to win that war is for us all to take a, a bit of a sense of collective responsibility. It's interesting that you use rhetoric um, as your example because that's not exactly something that you could quite legislate against. I feel like what you described in terms of putting in a control and a like a, the cost benefit analysis is is different than um, changing the language and shaping the narrative. Yeah. Oh, for sure, totally different uh, situations. And and if if we could only choose one, uh, I'd I'd promote the legislation uh, over the the rhetoric change. Uh, but I, I was actually building on your comment, Kimberly, that you know, at the same time that we could have put in place better. Uh, legislative constraints. Uh, we also could have been a little, we, certain leaders yeah. could have been a little better with their language. The holistic approach. I, I appreciate that. I think Abigail had a question. Yeah, I don't, um, so as a, can you hear me actually? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I unmuted myself. Okay. Yeah, I can okay. hear you. Uh, so, uh, as an epidemiologist, I feel like one of the challenges is that there's a constant request for more and more data, that there's never enough data to make good decisions, but then when decisions are made, they aren't actually made uh, based on the data that's provided. Um, so I'm wondering in a professional capacity, what advice you could provide to the people who are compiling and interpreting the data for policymakers um, to kind of help uh, kind of condition against these biases so the data is actually used when decisions are made, or at least considered? Um, well, I think a lot of that, it's a great question. I, a lot of it has to do with how we portray uncertainty in data. And, uh, you know, everyone has uh, got a bit of an aversion to uncertainty. Uh, and uh, that that's why I think the um, uh, the best case, worst case, and, and most likely case uh, portrayal is is quite accurate or is quite helpful. Um, uh, we learned in our uh, work to develop uh, projection models here in the greater Philadelphia area that um, our data held uh, considerably more impact if we showed the confidence intervals around our projections so, so as to accurately portray the uncertainty. Uh, but really bold-faced, highlighted, uh, and um, reinforced what the uh, summary model estimates uh, were portraying. And, um, and then even modeled like, so if it's this, and you do this, here's what the outcome would be. And if it winds up being this, much worse, and you do the same thing, that's what the average, so, so building actually on people's loss aversion uh, in a data portrayal way can, can be quite powerful. Great. 
Um, I think Muriel had a question. Yes, um, about bias, uh, um, I I wonder if there are some bias about like ideas that are quite unthinkable or uh, maybe some solutions that could be judged uh, badly. Um, as an example, I, I'm, a, I'm working in bioethics, so uh, on the third week of February, I started to think, oh, maybe there are some asymptomatic patients, so uh, people, so we won't see them in the airport and, and things like this. But then, like, the solution is, okay, well, solution would be stop to travel. And at that point, it was kind of unthinkable to propose that kind of solution. Well, where I am, maybe some other people have more, <laughs> um, I don't know, have a, a other position in society. But the point is, if I proposed this solution at that point, I would have been really kind of judged for, for saying that solution, I think, is, the, is a good one. And after, in, uh, I'm in Quebec. In the third week of March, I suggested to stop visits in hospitals uh, because I, I could see that the, the situation in healthcare here, it was kind of a bit crazy, like a lot of people were not tested and changing hospitals, so they kind of spread the disease uh, with healthcare workers themselves. So I said, okay, stop the visit because uh, it's unbearable. And I had so much backlash. Like, oh, uh, you are you are an ethicist and you are so unhuman to say the, stop the visit and things like this. So it's kind of very hard to make decisions in so or in in those situations, and we have to kind of think fast and it has huge impact. So I I think maybe there is a bias about uh, a bias about being judged uh, for making a decision that was n never seen and that is kind of hard to make. So I, I would just like to hear you about that, what you think about it. Yeah, so I, I, what, I, what I think I'm hearing you say is that there are uh, um, concerns about how we will be perceived if we make certain judgments uh, and set certain policies in motion. And, and I, un, unambiguously, that's true. Uh, I, I would argue that uh, elected officials are well aware of, of the potential for that, and, and they uh, have volunteered to head into the fray. Um, I would also say that, you know, we should and hopefully would be uh, judged similarly by uh, our failures to uh, take certain stances and enact certain uh, policies. Uh, if, though, if failing to do so uh, produces harm uh, in the same way that we would be judged uh, poorly by people who um, uh, think that, that what we're doing is itself more directly connoting harm. So I think a lot of it has to do with the same problem of omission bias that I was uh, referring to. The only other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, people's tendencies to, to judge policies as good or bad does tend to uh, rest on importantly on how it aligns with their priors and their personal beliefs and the groups that they identify with. So, um, you know, Republicans in the U.S., for example, who support the president uh, are more likely to think that uh, mask wearing is is not quite as essential than than liberals because, you know, the leader of, of their group is on record as saying that he doesn't think it's all that essential. So uh, that, that tends to guide a lot of our perceptions of policies or statements as well. Um, and one last question from the chat box. Uh, Donald asks, why do we hesitate to label the exercise of bias to harm through omission of policy enactment as, an, as a criminal behavior? Uh, well, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know that I hesitated to, I just never really thought to, um, it's, it, you know, to, to, uh, so I, so I, let me start out by saying that I don't disagree with what I perceive to be the sentiment behind the question, uh, which is that, 
uh, the harms caused by myopic policy responses are of an order of magnitude that is actually that are actually far greater than most things that we criminalize in the U.S. So, so I, it, from that vantage point, I, I, I think I agree with the um, at least the essence or, or the emotion behind the question. From, from, from a practical and kind of uh, logistical matter, uh, I'm not a lawyer by any means, but uh, my understanding of most civilized nations uh, legal systems that govern uh, acts that are or are not criminal uh, requires uh, that someone have standing to bring a suit. And so it's not entirely clear to me uh, what uh, group person or groups of people uh, would have standing to bring suits against those who make flawed policies. Although I could imagine situations where, um, you know, for example, a family of a loved one who caught COVID and they could say that, you know, had there been better contact tracing, uh, then they might not have, uh, could, you know, bring a suit and, and maybe it could be treated as a criminal offense. Uh, I haven't seen that case come to court, but I, I don't necessarily see why it could. It's early yet in this pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you so much, um, Dr. Scott Halpern, for talking to us. It was a lot of great food for thought. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, for anybody who is interested in meeting other Can COVID membership, we are having a mixer on Friday, uh, a Zoom mixer. And I wanted to plug that our lovely program assistant, um, Chloe Payne, who's also a theater professional, will be um, leading that off with some improv tips and, and help loosen us up and give some speaking advice to all of us scientist types. Uh, so please join us for that. And otherwise, we're going to be taking a hiatus for the speaker series um, for the month of August, but we will be returning on September 8th. So keep an eye on your email and we'll see you in September. Dr. Scott Halpern, thank you so much. Sure. Take care. Bye.